Hey everybody, Aaron Count with Sage Dynamics, and this is my review of the Holosun LE321. So as most of you already know, I'm only releasing videos periodically on YouTube. Uh, this video has already been released to the Patreon, they've already seen it. Uh, they're also getting a lot of content that is never longer going to the YouTube channel, and if you want to know about that, you can scroll up and find the video I talked about going Patreon exclusive, which technically not exclusive because you're seeing this video on YouTube. Uh, any video is going to go to Patreon first, and majority of the videos are going to go there only. You will see, like this one, you will still see the occasional video here, but if you want to get exclusive content and also see other videos first, you can head on over to Patreon and become a supporter. It's a smaller, it's a smaller crowd, which I definitely appreciate, and it's a more intelligent conversation. More signal, less noise. So without further ado, here's my review of the Holosun LE321. Kind of vacillate a little bit over how to introduce that. It's an IR laser, it's a green laser. They also offer it as a red laser. It has a built-in IR illuminator as well as an optional white light. It's a LAM, laser aiming module, a bunch of different terminology we see used for these. Basically, this is something I'm going to use primarily for night vision. And it's nice to have more options when it comes to laser aiming modules when it for night vision uses because there's a lot of great lasers out there. However, often the king of the hill is also prohibitively expensive. Night vision itself is not cheap. A lot of shooters never get into it because it is cost prohibitive. But night vision prices in general have started coming down because they're becoming more popular. Uh, the venerable PVS-14 running a monocular, it's been around for 20 plus years at this point, and you can find a really good high quality one for a reasonable, basically the price of a very nice AR rifle. So. Once you get night vision, it only makes sense that you then get a laser aiming module to be able to shoot that night vision without having to passively aim through a red dot optic. Initially, Holosun was well known for providing budget optics. Quality varied there at the beginning. However, over the past couple of years, their overall quality has greatly improved to be on par with some of the more venerable, the bigger, the more quality known names that are out there. So I was very interested to check out what some people might consider to be a budget option for a laser aiming module to use in our night vision. Now features for the LE321, you can get it in a green or a red laser. I opted for the green laser, even though green lasers don't have the same overall temperature operating zone, uh, they are a little bit more visible in light conditions than the red lasers are. It also has a 300 lumen light, which is built right into the lamb, but you can take the light head out, which is how you access the battery compartment anyway, and just put a plug in it. So then you're just running your green, your IR, and your IR illuminator. If you don't want that 300 lumen light, you wanna run something more powerful, which I would highly suggest. But if space is limited and you're not really worried about being able to get illumination for greater distances, say you're mounting it on a PDW or something like that, the 300 lumen light is kind of a nice feature to have and it's kind of forward thinking. They can kind of produce an additional head or a more powerful head that would be, it would have to be powered by a single 123, but they could give you a little bit more lumen and a little bit, can, a little bit more candela. It is a titanium body, which is something Holosun likes to do with as many of their products as possible, is house them in titanium. There's a remote cable switch that is optional. It's got multiple settings. You've got IR low, IR high, illuminator, uh, illuminator high, illuminator low, uh, illuminator with laser, illuminator without laser, green laser. You've got all the traditional settings that you'd come to expect from a laser aiming module. Now the unfortunate part about unrestricted lasers being Apollo Sun and then, you know, Adipol C's and, and some of the other uh, unrestricted lasers that are out there is they are kind of slave to a legal requirement to not have a certain output. They can't go over a certain degree or a certain amount of power. Uh, main reason for that is restricted lasers, the more powerful lasers, can very easily permanently blind people. And I think that was the government's primary thinking in restricting their purchase, which I completely disagree with, uh, but it's just the world that we have to live in. So when it comes to unrestricted lasers, you're really looking for people's different approaches to how they apply it, or everybody's performance is roughly gonna be close to the same and you're choosing it based on brand and features. Now the green laser operates in the 520 nanometer re nanometer region, which if you're geeky like I am, that's a really good vibrant green. 
A divergence is something that we have to have in lasers, meaning the laser is slowly going to spread out the further it gets away from the point of origin. The reason we want that is to be able to see the laser, the small little dot that we're using to aim at extended distances. Now I'm not much of a visible laser fan. They do have their place, but as a primary default method of aiming, it's not something I want to use, mainly because it's very light condition dependent. IR laser is kind of a different story because under night vision, well, I mean, it's, it's, it's night vision and you still have divergence. In fact, with the case of the hollow sun laser, it operates in the 830 nanometer range with a divergence of 0.5 MRAD. The visible laser has a divergence of 0.6 MRAD. 0.5 MRAD is kind of a standard. Uh, you see that on most uh, IR illuminators, IR, or, say IR lasers. It gives me a good divergence as I get further away from the point of origin to still be able to see my dot and still be able to get my hit. Unlike what we get with like a full power restricted laser like an LA5 or a MAL DA, I can go full power, uh, just full Ricky Bobby, and I can see the beam almost like a lightsaber. So I can follow my own beam out to the target. Uh, with restricted lasers, or I'm sorry, unrestricted lasers, I'm not going to be able to do that because by law they just can't put out that much power. They cannot meet a certain mill. they're not able to go over legally over a certain milliwatt. So I'm restricted to, like I said earlier, brand loyalty or features. Using the LE321 with green laser. Uh, like I said, not a primary method of aiming I'm going to choose. Very light condition to pin. It's going to work well indoors if you have mesopic or twilight conditions. Outdoors, you pretty much need twilight or darkness. That being said, the laser does perform well. It maintains zero. Now, in my 2000 round review process, uh, pretty much anything firearms related is going to go through the same process. Uh, the two big things that, 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 that we see in my videos, one being the 500 round burn down, which we'll get to, and two, every 500 rounds, I do a drop test, be it optic, laser, whatever it is, it's going to get that drop, which simulates uh, the optic or the device itself taking a hard impact during use. It's something I'm gonna do, it's something I'm gonna keep doing. It's a little bit controversial, but I think we wanna make sure things maintain zero, and that's the main reason why I did it, because I'm pretty much gonna stay roughly the same height the rest of my life, so the drop testing is not scientific, but it is controlled from roughly the same elevation every single time. Overall, the performance is what I would expect from an unrestricted laser. And I hate the fact that it's very difficult for these companies to find a way to get around the legal benchmark of you cannot do this. It's really unfortunate because under night vision, it is nice to have a brighter laser. Usually the lasers themselves do great. So the, this is this optic, or I should say this lamb, the Holosun lamb is no different. The laser is really good. The illuminator is where we start to have problems. I do not have the horsepower I would like to have to be able to contrast or illuminate my targets at those extended distances. But then we get into a little bit of most likely to least likely applications, right? So if I'm using this as a citizen, uh, how far out am I realistically gonna need to shoot with it? How far out can I positively identify a target in order to shoot at it? So a military application takes a slightly different approach. Those more powerful lasers are like, hey, those guys aren't supposed to be there. Recognize they don't have transponders or little blinking lights or uh, haven't been identified themselves by radio, so we can go ahead and light those bad dudes up. Uh, civilian setting, law enforcement setting, got a PID. So if you, in the unlikely event, but very possible, because everything is, if you were to use night vision in a self-defense setting, it's always good to positively identify what you're shooting at to make sure you're supposed to be shooting at it. So that gets us, brings us in uh, to a certain distance unless you're running, you know, a slaved uh, night vision device on a magnified optic, but then you kind of don't need the laser in that case. So will this give you reasonable distance for shooting? Yes, but the illuminator, and it's not just unique to the hollow sun, pretty much all unrestricted illuminators suffer from the ability to put out the horsepower because of the legal uh, restrictions that are placed on the companies that manufacture them. That said, the laser and illuminator, and the illuminator, of course, being adjustable, did allow me to get hits out to 100, 150, and 200 meters shooting on steel. PID, again, I would need a magnified optic to realistically PID targets of 200 meters, and probably, especially under night vision, uh, at 100 meters and maybe even 50 meters. Another thing to talk about is the uh, optional white light, that 300 lumen light. It's pretty much a garage light. I'm not getting a lot of candela on it, meaning I don't have a lot of intensity, not a really defined hot spot. I've just got a lot of flood. It's usable. 
Uh, however, once you introduce it into a more realistic lighting condition, such as backlighting, side lighting, or just more ambient light pollution, it makes it very hard to PID targets even at 25 yards. So like I said, it's not something I would personally use. I'd go ahead and just put the cap in it and run an actual dedicated white light, like a mod light or cloud defensive or surefire or something like that, to be able to give you more horsepower, more candela, uh, more lumens also is always a good thing. All the lumens, all the candela. Getting into the burn down. What is the burn down? It is 500 rounds as quickly as possible to see if that, in, that accelerator rate of fire identifies issues that wouldn't otherwise be seen shooting the same amount of ammunition over a much longer period of time. Because of the mounting position, default mounting position, especially me, I always mount my lasers as far forward as possible. Uh, it's sitting right under, or I'd say right over that gas block. And I'm gonna do 500 rounds as quickly as possible and see if I uh, notice any issues. So here's your burn down. Five hundred rounds, and the body of the optic definitely became noticeably hotter, especially the mount. But the high, even up top, feeling it up top, it was almost too hot to maintain two, three seconds worth of touch on it. Checking the zero, checking the features, everything still worked the way it was supposed to work. I should have done the burn down at night so I could immediately check the IR behavior, uh, but I went off and put it in uh, basically in the, the bed liner of my truck so I had a nice dark spot and checked the laser using uh, PVS-14. Laser was good to go, no flickering, no weird behavior like that. Um, Sometimes when lasers gets hot, they do weird things. This thing not only maintains zero, but the laser, both the visible and the IR laser, uh, checking it, uh, maintain the performance that I would expect. Basically, first round performance is what I had in the last round performance after the 500 on burn down. One of the things I've definitely noticed over my career is lasers sometimes just lose their zero. And sometimes there's no rhyme or reason to it. And quality has improved across the board, manufacturers producing better lasers. But I'm always suspicious of a laser maintaining a zero. I could put it in the safe after zeroing it. And when I took it back out, I would literally be like, I don't know if it's zeroed or not. I don't have the same degree of trust in a laser zero as I do in an optic zero. Uh, and maybe that's just a little bit of paranoia on my part after having used uh, bad laser aiming modules in the past or less than ideal laser aiming modules in the past or just hand-me-down laser. I mean, uh, the, the PEC-2 and the PEC-4 and, and the PEC-15 that I used in the military uh, all went through multiple hands before I ever touched them. So with this, I wanted to make sure it was going to maintain that zero. Also, I'm doing drop test. Every 500 rounds, it gets a shoulder height drop test. Here is a five round group I shot using the visible laser uh, at 50 meters, which is my converging zero point of aim, prior to the first drop test. And then I dropped it every 500 rounds. And here is a five round group shot at the same distance, 50 meters, my converging point of zero between the visible laser and my red dot sight, uh, after the last drop test. I would call that return to zero. It's still something, and like I said, you know, a caveat you should definitely have, or something you should definitely keep in mind, is anytime you drop an optic, uh, anytime you drop a rifle, if it's got an optic on it, it's got a laser on it, check that zero before you trust it, definitely. But I'm happy with the performance. Four shoulder height drop tests, 2,000 rounds, maintained zero. Performance was great. Uh, this is a really good budget option. Now, you may right now be looking up the price of this and be like, well, that's not budget. It is for a laser aiming module. Night vision is just going to remain more intrinsically expensive than some of the other things that we do with shooting. So a budget laser is still going to be more expensive than what, might, what people might get in mind. And I will say right now, 
this performs as well as some of the other unrestricted lasers that are out there. It's not going to perform as well or better than a restricted laser. There's just no way. But for the price, you're getting a really good laser and a really good footprint and a really smart design. Everything about this from the fire position to the optional tape switch to the rear adjustment controls to pick your modes is very smart. I think they really thought it out or they just got lucky. I'd like to think that they put some th thought into the design of it and it marries itself well to whatever you're going to put it on. If you're going to run it on like I got it on a 10.5 Roscoe right now, but I could definitely slap it on something that has way less real estate. Say it's like a P90 or a TP9 or any kind of SMG or PDW, this laser would be right at home there. It's got a small compact footprint and it's got some good features. Also the white light is there, so if you don't have the real estate, or you just don't have the, the funds for a really better white light than what you're using right now, everything's all encased in, in one package. I would like to see more aftermarket support such as switches and accessories for this. I think if it increases in popularity, we're gonna see that. But for the price, and just in general, for an unrestricted laser, this is an excellent choice. I'm Eric Cowan with Sage Dynamics. Train accordingly.